It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Jennifer Jolly. Ms. Jolly, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us for our Family Business Services webcast, the 10 must-haves for excellent succession planning. Today, we will answer questions that will help you prepare for the future of your company, including how to balance the needs of your business with the wants of your family, how to begin to determine the next leader of your company, and how to plan, manage, and communicate your retirement plans to your family, partners, and employees. We look forward to answering the questions that you submit as well. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter from the Family Business Consulting Group. Dana Telford specializes in succession planning, family governance, board effectiveness, and conflict management. He earned an MBA from Harvard Business School and is a third generation member of a commercial real estate firm. Dana, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all. Thanks for joining us, depending on where you are or what time you might be watching this. I've got a lot to cover here related to succession planning, so I'm going to go along at a pretty good clip, but want you to know that if you have further questions or want to clarify any of this, you're, you're welcome to contact me or Otis, who's not able to join us today. Otis Baskin is someone that I do a lot of work with uh, in our affiliation with the bank. And uh, we can clarify any, any particular questions that you might have. Uh, succession planning is a driving issue in the world of family business. So often when I or colleagues of mine at the Family Business Consulting Group are asked to be helpful to a family, it's related to a pending transition, some sort of, of uh, transfer of assets, control, uh, management, and leadership from one generation to a next. And what, what this means is, is you're biting off a, a big, big piece of a big, big elephant. A complicated system is a family business system. Some of you may be familiar with what is known in the world of family business as the three-circle model created by Renato Tajiri and John Davis which shows that, that a group of owners and a group of business leaders and a family that has interest in the success of the business come together to create a very complicated system. Those three circles come together, but what really that uh, confluence creates is seven separate individual roles that are being played inside of what I would call a family business system. You know what this feels like, but hopefully by me describing it a little bit more, you'll understand a little bit of, about why it's so complicated. So there are outside owners in some systems. Uh, there are employee owners in some systems. There are many, many employees. By and large, this circle, number three there, if you follow along with me, is the largest number of individuals in a system and, of course, significant in, in succession planning. The needs and wants and desires and hopes of long-term key managers is often a, a driving priority in the work of succession planning and continuity planning that I and my colleagues do. If you're a young member of a family uh, listening in today, never underestimate the significance that long-term key employees play in the, your parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles, whoever might be the preceding generation, uh, that they feel for those people. They feel a great loyalty to them, and they really should because of the the work that they've done together and the things that they've created. Family employees, now we're down in number four, uh, are a big part of this. Family members, number five, are individuals who don't own shares in a company and don't work in a company, but are influential significantly. And then family owners are what some would call passive owners, or those who own but don't manage a business. And then there are those in the middle. There are seven. The eye of the storm is the, uh, the man or woman or group of men or women who are trying to really keep all three organizations happy and productive and focused on the overarching goals of the ownership group and the family. So what this creates is a system that has seven different positions, all of which, all of whom have perspectives that change, that can change. I might be a family employee and therefore might be looking at a particular issue or problem from the employment perspective one day and then might be thinking about it very much from the family's perspective, perhaps following a family meeting or a discussion that happened over dinner that changes uh, my, my perspective. Um, they all influence the system more so than expected. 
And finally, that last piece, the owner-manager family member is in the eye of the perfect storm. One thing I'll say before we move on from this slide is a, a mistake that we see our clients make, and by, I say our, by saying our clients, I mean those who are in control of a family business system, who have legal rights to make decisions about a system, if they underestimate the influence, uh, potentially negative or positive influence that members of a family might have, uh, they're making a, a pretty significant mistake. Oftentimes issues, whether they're health-related or whether they're uh, behavior-related in the family, can influence a business for better or for worse. Uh, the only suggestion there is to pay close attention to the levels of relationship, trust, and interaction at the family, and uh, put together some sort of a process, even if it's minimal, to let those, uh, you know, let issues come out of the family and be put into a, a system of management and identification. A little bit of investment there can go a long, long way. Uh, the complexity of a family business and the complexity of of succession is significant. Um, Stu Leonard's is a grocery chain uh, in Connecticut. Um, Stu has often told the story of uh, his board coming to him after uh, working with him on succession issues and, and, and suggesting to him that his son Tom was miscast in a role that he was playing in this grocery business. And Stu tells the story very well of using hats to help separate the different perspectives of the family and the ownership group. And I'll tell you that story. Um, if you don't learn anything else today uh, as you listen to this, potentially this, this simple analogy and use of hats to represent different perspectives can, can be very beneficial in a, in a future conversation that you're going to have with a member of your family or ownership group. So Stu called his son Tom into his office, and he had two hats on his desk. And again, Tom had underperformed in his role as the leader. I need to stop here and just let you know the, the Leonard family has not been a client of mine. This is public information. He's told the story many times in many public areas. Confidentiality is very important to me and to the bankers that we work with. So please know that this is not a breach in any way. Uh, Stu said to his son, Tom, look, there's, there's been some issues, and I'm going to put on my chairman of the board hat here as we talk together. And uh, he said, you're fired. And he said, now I'm going to take off my chairman of the board hat, and I'm going to put on my father's hat. And you know, Stu has a peculiar sense of humor, and he, he literally asked Tom at that point, you know, your mom and I heard you just lost your job, and we're wondering what's going on with you personally. And as weird as that was and quirky as that was, uh, and, and Tom, you know, has, has talked about that pretty openly too, his point was, what's going on with Tom, my son? And Tom said, do you really want to know, Dad? And he said, yeah, I do. And he said, I, I can't stand working for you, and I'm glad that you fired me. And Stu was stunned and said, what do you mean? And and. Tom said, well, you know, I'm 40 years old, and I've got kids of my own, and I've got uh, many, many uh, responsibilities, and I've achieved different things. But, but when you come into what he called my store, which was interesting because he didn't have ownership at that point, he said, I start to feel like I'm a teenage boy again. I mean, you're, you're telling me this isn't good enough, this isn't good enough, you didn't do this, and it starts to feel like you're telling me I didn't pick up my room, I didn't take out the garbage, I didn't fill up the car with gas, I didn't do kind of the chores around the home, and, it, it, and, and it's frustrating. And I'm glad you fired me. And Stu was hurt as he heard him talk about this, uh, and he was very open about this uh, in, in this presentation. He said, I, I thought I was a better father than this. And he said, as he talked about uh, these pains and issues that he was going through, it hurt me. And, and I said, well, why didn't you tell me any of this, Tom? And he said, well, you're my dad, and you're my father. I love you, and you're a great father. And, you know, it's hard to disappoint your father, and I didn't want to tell you that I, that I really don't want to work with you. So Stu said, well, what are you going to do now uh, after some time as, as they kind of settled down? And Tom had a plan and a strategy for creating his own fresh produce market in Richmond, Virginia, which he did, and, and uh, very independent-minded like his dad and wanted to do his own thing but had to kind of they had to get through that very difficult, complicated 
dance of father-son relationship that is encapsulated in a family business system. Think of the emotional strain on, on the son, especially in this, in this situation. Uh, he wants to please his father. That's natural for all of us as children. He, and the, in order to do that, he needs to perform in a way that makes uh, his father feel like he is talented. Well, his dad started the company and created the company and loves the company, and many would argue that creates a higher level of performance and expectation. So in many ways, it's almost impossible for Tom to outperform his father in the position. We're going to talk more about that as we talk about uh, finding the next leaders. So, so remember the power of the hats. If you're going to have an ownership discussion uh, somewhere on a, in the boardroom uh, with family members involved, and you know, talk about the fact that you're wearing the ownership hat. Communicate as owners and clarify then if anyone kind of jumps out of that circle and into the family circle and make sure that there is understanding of, of the basis of the conversation because the goals of different organizations dictate the level of communication and the way that different messages will be heard and relayed. So succession planning, it's a hard game to get through. Uh, statistically, if 100 family businesses are successful in generation one and the goal is to pass them to the second generation, two out of three will fail. If the goal is then to take a successful second generation, so a sibling-owned sibling business, and pass it on to a cousin group, the chances, again, are one in three that you'll be successful, two out of three that you'll fail. And beyond that, into a cousin and second cousin group, the probability gets higher. All of this, to get right to the point of it, is, is based in the, the enormous complexities, emotional complexities specifically, um, you know, strategic differentiation and goals, sorry, different strategic goals of family members as it gets into the ownership of the family business. Uh, I was asked a, a, a very interesting question by a banker uh, who looked at this slide and said, you know, the, the history of our world really is one of primogeniture, that that the oldest male is given the first opportunity and is often given controlling ownership throughout time. And, and she said, perhaps this has some significance in the number of failures and failed attempts at passing these on to the next generation. I'm smiling as I say this because it's a really terrific point that whatever we're doing to get family businesses from one generation to the next, if the goal is to do it, we're not being successful. I mean, unless you're playing baseball, you know, one out of three is really not great as a, as a statistic uh, that, that represents success. So a great question. Um, and, and it's part of the complexity of the family. When we think about what happens to us as human beings, all right, as we're thinking through succession and continuity, what we're dancing around really is an emotional response between two people who care a lot about each other. We've all been around long enough, if we're on this call, to know that we're emotional beings and that whether we're expressive or open, we do feel things and feel them very intensely. And one way to get um, a, a, a productive conversation about succession planning and continuity to shut down is to push emotional triggers in each other that create a defensive response that, that shut down communication and that make it very, very difficult to get through the complexities. One of the things that can create that complexity, that emotional complexity, is, is if you think about the difference between our families as an organization and our businesses as organizations, much of it really can, can be... Um, compared to the differences between socialism or communism and capitalism. And I know there's all kinds of political ramifications with using those words, uh, particularly at this point in American history, but think about it. Socialism and communism uh, was described by Karl Marx as, you know, taking from each according to their, to their um, abilities and giving out according to need. So if, if you can produce a lot, you know, put it in the kitty, and then based on uh, need, we'll pass it out. It's not based on merit. It's not based on 
earning, it's really based on kind of this, this whole collective pot of, of whatever it is, food, money, resources. And, and in our families, we dole out those resources based on the needs. And we should. We all agree that. If someone is unhealthy, if someone has uh, an educational need, if someone has um, a transportation need, if, if housing, food, clothing is not being provided, um, that that's where assets and resources will go first. If we, if we dangerously use that same mentality in our businesses, uh, there's a strong argument that says that we won't be in business very long. If we allocate resources based on need and not based on what we see as the potential return on that investment in capital and in time, uh, then you know we're, we're, we're running a short-term plan is what I would call it. So the socialistic behavior, if it's engendered in a child, which it really is in all of our children to a certain point, and I know there are different styles of parenting, but it, if, if a child comes to the family's business with the mentality that is essentially, uh, look, you know, I'm of royal blood and I've now come to, you know, bless your lives with my presence and, you know, all hail the prince or the princess um, and, and let resources flow to me because of my genetic uh, predisposition, I guess, would be, uh, then we got a problem. And so part of what, what continuity planning has to do is separate the family's uh, propensity towards socialistic behavior from the business's absolute need to be competitive and to alloc allocate resources based on return. That message needs, needs to be given loud and clear. People ask all the time, when, when can children hear that? Children can hear that at different times in their lives based on their own maturity levels, and, and that's the hard answer because it means one of your children might be able to hear that at age nine. Another one might not be ready to hear that message at age 19. And the judgment about when to give the message and how to give it and who should give it is up to parents. Uh, you may want to get some outside advice and help with that kind of a, a question. And we'll get to that here down the road in this presentation as well. Now, just a couple other thoughts about the differences between family organizations and business organizations. Remember, families, again, are based in uh, the allocation of resources based in need. Uh, it's relationship-driven business uh, or organizational model. It's very qualitative. It's about love and kindness and peace and harmony. It's involuntary, right? Think about that. We choose one person in our family, and that is when we choose to get married. Um, all other folks, I guess, so to speak, come along with that one decision. In-laws just show up. Children are born and you choose to have children uh, most of the time, but they come with a personality and kind of a set of, of, of genetic fabric that, that arguably um, was, was set you know, in the brain at some point previously. So because of that, it's a very permanent set of relationships. We certainly can disengage from family interactions, but our DNA won't change, our blood won't change. Uh, the difference in, in a business is that it is voluntary. Uh, it is temporary. It's very quantitative. It's measured and measured and measured. I do a lot of work with families that are in the automotive retail business, and I'm stunned at how much they measure. I mean, it's like baseball players uh, and the statistics of, of uh, you know, baseball uh, are used in, in more and more in auto retail and in other industries. So you know how well you're doing based on uh, your statistics in relative to others. So it's a complicated system. Uh, on both sides. When they clash together, they can create an emotional response. And if we don't manage that, that relationship, we're not going to get very far in thinking through succession planning. So the 10 must-haves for excellent succession planning. I'd say, you know, I was thinking about this this morning, um, nine of these are must-haves. The 10th really is a should-have, and that should-have is, is it's a normative statement that I'm, I really feel strongly about. Uh, so I'll call it a should-have for today. Um, you can call it a must-have if you want. But we're going to go specifically through these. So personal financial plan for the owners, a vision of legacy for the owners, a commitment to a specific retirement style, uh, a fair market valuation. What are we really talking about? How much money are we talking about? Leadership contingency planning, getting outside advisors to help make good decisions, 
determining what the next group of leaders must do before we think about who those people are is really important. And then uh, timeline. What time do we need to evaluate? What time do we need to choose? Uh, what, how much time do we need until we can integrate that new leader or set of leaders into the model that we are into the business? And then when do we let go? And then finally, the should have, honoring the legacy of outgoing leaders. I, I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship. It, it charges me up. I love it, and, and it is phenomenal around the world, the, the, the amount of energy and positive benefit that entrepreneurship and business ownership creates in this world. I'd say it's the strongest force uh, in economics is private, family-owned businesses, absolutely. And so I make a big point of to the next generation, Honor the, the outgoing leaders because they've given their lives in many ways to this business, and they love that business. So let's honor them in a way that's appropriate and authentic to what they've created and what that legacy is going to be. Okay, the details. So the first question, and this is about as far as me and my colleagues get into the world of financial planning, is to start with a question. How much do I want each month? If I'm the family business owner, and I'm going to pass it to the next generation. It's not going to happen until I feel financially secure. And it shouldn't happen until I feel financially secure. So the, the, the straightforward question, maybe not simple to answer, is how much money do I want each month? How much money do I want to flow into my account each month so that I'm not going to have to worry about the basics of life and the lifestyle that I feel like I have earned? Uh, there's a lot of different answers to that question I'm learning. I've had people very nonchalantly say, you know, well, it's about what it needs, you know, what it is now, which is a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. Uh, others would say, you know, $8,000 a month, $10,000 a month, twenty, whatever that number is, that's an important starting point. And the second is, if I'm going to have a nest egg somewhere, regardless of where that came from, how much is that? Uh, so that I can feel secure about doing what I want to do and knowing that uh, I'm going to be comfortable. And the third question is, what are the current and potential sources of cash that can fund those uh, that first one on a monthly basis and that can create that, that uh, nest egg in the second one? These are the, the best questions to, to get into with your bankers uh, because, you know, Otis and I and our colleagues can, can, can try and get some round numbers going, uh, but the specifics of these – really depend on your tax situation, uh, your balance sheet, your cash flow, all of those uh, measures of financial stability and success that, that, that they can truly help you with in creating a plan going forward. And then the second must-have is, is a, a vision of personal legacy. So Stephen Covey um, made famous the idea of beginning with the end in mind. Yeah, if we're going somewhere, let's envision where we want to get to. And, and I like to think in succession planning about a specific question, which is what's the first thing that I hope my grandkids think of when they think of me? Whether I'm here or whether I'm no longer here, what is the first thing that I hope they think of? Do I want them to think of me as an entrepreneur, uh, as a kind um, you know, uh, grandfather, grandmother? Do I want them to think of me as a, as a philanthropist? Uh, do I want them to think of me as someone who is very active in community involvement, maybe politics? Do I want them to think of me as, as wealthy? What is it that I'm trying to leave as kind of the stamp of my life on this world? Uh, because the grandkids are the ones that I, I know uh, drive so much of the behavior in the senior generation. Is what, what are they going to be able to have and remember of me when I'm gone. Making a commitment to a retirement style. So Jeff Sonnenfeld uh, has, has coined the four ideas here of retirement styles, and they're fun to talk about. And as a suggestion to you, if you're looking for an excuse to get a family together and kind of break the ice about succession planning and family business, here's a way to do it. Uh, sit down together and let's say, you know, let's talk about individual retirement styles. And if you're the controlling owner or, or if you're in the senior generation, why don't you ask the question to your kids, to your brothers and sisters, even to your parents if, if they're involved and say, you know, there's four different styles of retirement. Which one am I portraying now? The first one is the monarch who, 
passes away and, and basically retires when his or her heart stops beating. Um, and I'll stop here and say, owners of businesses, controlling owners of businesses, have every legal right to be a monarch. There's no law, there's no uh, statute anywhere in our country that says that parents are responsible for giving their assets to their kids. It's not written anywhere. Uh, by and large, we all believe that it's a good idea, and by and large, we believe that it's a, it's a good show of love and also a combination of trust by trusting the next generation. But there is no legal requirement. It's a moral agreement that's made. So if somebody wants to die a monarch, they have every right to do it. I would only say if that's your plan, please communicate that to the next generation and to those around you because there are contingency decisions that they need to make related to that. Uh, I cannot tell you how sad I was the day I heard a 60-year-old man whose father was still running their, their retail jewelry business uh, in the Northeast. His father was 85, and in an interview with this man, I said, well, what, you know, what are your goals? You know, what, what, are your, what are your objectives going forward? And he said at age 60, you know, I'm just I'm waiting for my chance, you know, my chance to show what I can do as a leader. And I thought, oh, wow. I mean, this was this was a plan that went awry somewhere, uh, or maybe it was a plan that, uh, that to be a monarch that just wasn't communicated. The second is the general. The general is one who understands the need for succession planning, goes through the motions, uh, perhaps you know has the party and rides off over the hill and into the sunset, uh, but only to hear kind of gunshots and trouble uh, back in the distance. So he, he or she comes riding back over the hill to solve the problem. And, and essentially the, the, the feeling is, well, I knew you couldn't do it on your own, so you're, you're going to need me around, it looks like. And then generally that the general sticks around from that point forward. The third is the ambassador. This is the ideal in, in many people's minds, hard to get to, but ideal conceptually. And the ambassador is one who sees a transition coming, plans for it, integrates a new leader, and, and makes sure that that new leader is, is propped up and comfortable with relationships and responsibilities and roles, but then is close by and says, look, if you need to reach me, call me. You know, there's no, no real rational reason for you to reinvent the wheel of this role. So I've been through a lot. I, I learned a lot from those before me. Let me know if you've got a particular problem. And then the fourth is the governor. The governor um, loses an election and essentially hands over the keys to the, the mansion and the role of government and says, you know, I'm gone. Don't call me and goes off to bigger and better things, whatever that might be, a boat somewhere or another role. Um, Again, take a minute and talk through these four different retirement styles. You may even want to add another one if you can think of a different one. And, and talk with the next generation and with your siblings if you're in a sibling partnership and say, well, you know, what's the goal for me? And if you really feel comfortable saying, I'm going to be an ambassador, or, hey, I'm going to be a governor because once this is, is over for me, I want it over and I want to move on to something else and you guys will benefit from that, then make it clear. Communicate it to as many people as possible for two reasons. One, it's going to help you start to really wrap your head around it and your heart around the notion that you're not going to be leading that organization in the future. But two, it's also going to help uh, the, the next group prepare for the transition and start to take on additional responsibility. Fair market valuation. If you're going to pass assets to the next generation, you have to know what they're worth. So often I talk to people uh, particularly in the first generation, and I think this is, to me, it's just it's a natural and 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 it's a it's a very predictable part of entrepreneurship, which is the entrepreneur might have a million dollars in the bank, um, but but he or she might often still feel like there's just no telling what happens tomorrow, and that's because there were many 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 weeks, months, and years potentially where that bank balance was down in the $1,000 or $2,000 range, and all it took was uh, a couple of, of uh, minor problems um, that could wipe it all out. Or even if there's 100000 or 500000 in an account, uh, with big organizations, it doesn't take much, so that's gone, and you feel like cash has drained 
out. And as, as we all know, I remember a saying from a, a finance course uh, in business school, revenue is, is vanity for us, profit is um, sanity, uh, but cash really is the reality that we're all dealing with, cash in the bank. So getting a true valuation of what we have is the start. Uh, you know, get reputable valuation services. Absolutely, they're expensive, uh, but much like great tax advice, I mean, there are dollars spent that that are 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 they return gold because of the value of understanding. Um, parents really shouldn't rely on children for financial support. I don't think any of us want to either have our parents rely on us for financial re- uh, support, or I don't want. I don't think there are many of us who, with children want to be waiting for a kind of a crumb to fall off the dining room table of our kids so that we have comfort and sustenance going forward. So the sooner we get uh, this kind of talk about how much money do we have, how much, you know, what's our asset uh, basis look like, what's our net worth look like, what's the value of this business, what's the value of our real estate holdings and other assets, then we can really start to say, uh, here's where we're going from here. Uh, the fifth point is, uh, is about um, kind of the bad news, and, and the bad news is for all of us that there are lots of buses out there. So, so there's this saying, you know, what if I get hit by a bus tomorrow? Well, there's lots of them that can mean that, that we expire and that we're no longer here. And as a part of thinking through a worst-case scenario, which, again, is not probable, but it is certainly possible, is a suggestion that you start a meeting, whether it's a board meeting, whether it's a family council meeting, whether it's an executive management meeting, with the following scenario. You walk in with a pad of paper and a pen or pencil, or you've got a a digital recorder, uh, or you've got a scribe there to work with you, and you start that meeting uh, with a surprise, which is, unfortunately, you'll say, on my way to work this morning, I was hit by a bus, and I'm no longer here. And then be quiet, and don't answer the questions that are posed to you, but take furiously notes that help you determine where the gaps are in planning for uh, a contingency. Uh, that notepad or that digital recorder then can create an agenda that will help you going forward uh, to really know, you know, what do we need to have? What do we need to, where are the gaps? Where, where, are, the, where are the leadership gaps, the information gaps, the communication and relationship gaps that I need to fill in as part of my responsibility? Unfortunately, I have experienced over the last 15 years of my consulting uh, on, on a number of occasions now, um, three different occasions, where after pushing gently a client to go through the contingency planning process, to get a phone call at some point um, in the future from a distraught spouse or child saying, um, you know, it happened, Dana, it happened. And uh, he or she is no longer here. And I'm, I'm glad that we went through what was a difficult discussion about the end of life. And um, it helped as hard as it was. And do it again and again. I mean, not every week, of course, but certainly take the time and make it consistent. One of the things that can come out of this um, is what I would call a crash card. So, so often as I interview um, clients and their families as part of my consulting work, a spouse of a controlling owner or a significant leader in a family business system will say, look, uh, you know, my greatest fear is that something will happen to, to Mary or to John uh, and that I will be clueless because I've been focused on either managing the household or managing the philanthropy or managing the business and so when, when my, my spouse or partner dies, I won't have any idea where to go, who to turn to, who to trust, where the information is, where all the banking account information is, where are the trust documents, where are the estate documents. And so create a crash card, a five-by-seven laminated card that has information about bankers, attorneys, CPAs, uh, clergy, that's got document-specific information, social security numbers, uh, bank account numbers, um, all of the information that you will need in a worst-case scenario. You, may, you probably don't want to have passwords on there. My suggestion would be that you have another card, maybe in a safe deposit box, 
uh, that has that information or that you have it stored digitally and encrypted. Uh, but, but that simple laminated card I've seen create so much relief in spouses uh, as they go through uh, the thought of contingency. Uh, the next point, objective outside advice. Can we as parents really judge our children objectively? Uh, if we were all sitting together in a room, we could have a conversation about this for a long, long time. Uh, many would say, most would say, based on this conversation, no, we cannot. And there is a split then after that um, argument. And some will say, we see our children as better than they really are. Others would say, we are more critical of our children than we really should be. I think a lot of that has to do with a work relationship. I think there are many, many fathers, type A um, business owning entrepreneur fathers, who set a very high expectation for their sons in business. Whether that's right or wrong, uh, good or bad, I don't know. But it certainly is a real pattern. By the way, uh, John Davis, uh, uh, who has done much research in the world of family business, uh, did an analysis and survey between uh, fathers and sons who had working relationships that were active and going on and asked the fathers and sons both to relate or sorry to rate their relationship along a bunch of different uh, uh, metrics the quality of that relationship you know how easy it was to work with each other how, how well each they worked uh, listened to each other and communicated things like that. And in every case, this was 50 pairs, I believe, 50 pairs of fathers and sons. In every case, uh, the son rated the relationship with the father worse than the father related it with the son. That's a statistically significant uh, metric. And it says something about kind of the emotional differences between um, the father's perspective and the son's in those relationships. There have not been uh, studies done about... Um, mothers and daughters in work relationships, uh, at least not that I know of. Uh, I hope that it's happening now because increasingly those relationships are a part of a family business system. So getting objective out, outside advice to help us understand how good our children really are at what they need to be good at if this business is going to continue to flourish. It's really brutal. Uh, or, or it's, it's vital, sorry. It, it can be brutal too, <laughs> but it's a vital, vital point. Where are these outside advisors? Uh, you know, the short answer, anybody who can bring to, to a boardroom table uh, an objective analysis, okay, and that's a judgment you have to make, uh, but I can help you by saying don't, you know, avoid close family ties uh, in evaluating the, uh, the potential um, talent and performance of a, of a child. Um, avoid conflicts of interest, right? CPAs, attorneys, um, consultants uh, often have uh, a conflict of interest that presents itself at a boardroom level. And avoid friends who may trade objectivity for peace, somebody who's going to go along with you just to get along with you is someone you don't want. Now, John Ward, who is a mentor to me and the founder uh, with Craig Aronoff of the Family Business Consulting Group, he and I were together in India last year, and we gave a two-day workshop to leading business families in India. And at the very end of the second day, the last day, someone said to ask John, who's been doing this for, for many, many years now, um, you know, what's the single most beneficial decision that families have made over your career uh, in family business? And very quickly he said, creating outside advisory boards. As hard as it is, emotionally, psychologically, physically, and financially, um, to get outside advisors onto a board, it's the greatest benefit, and I would echo that statement. Now we get on to a discussion about what, are, what does the next generation of leadership need to do well in order for this business conti to continue to be successful. And I, I like to use a very simple analogy that we're all very comfortable with, which is the golden goose. Golden eggs are wonderful. We all love them. We all want more of them. We'd like them to be thicker, particularly with the price of gold, and, and we'd, like, we'd like more and more geese also that are laying golden eggs. Let's, let's not be shy about that. So the whole mentality of succession planning too often gets into a discussion about power and control 
when in reality the most important dynamic of the next generation of leadership has to be talent. How capable is, is this group or individual at protecting this golden goose? Because when the golden goose is healthy and the golden eggs are flowing, everybody's happy. When the eggs stop coming, this is when big problems can start up. So describing what the leaders must be able to do well in order for the goose to be healthy is crucial. And keep in mind that what the next generation of leaders must do well is different than what you and your generation had to be able to do well. Social media, obviously, is, is the easiest uh, difference in, in managing a marketing scheme and marketing um, strategy of a business. It's something that is, is growing and growing and growing across the world. So skill sets for the next leaders, job descriptions to protect the goose. Here's just a sample, very simple kind of a template that can be used to first determine the what they need to be good at and then to get into who could possibly be a leader in this next generation, and what role could they play? Let's not forget that DNA does not equal talent. I work with a car dealer uh, who uh, is open with me, and I know this is definitely name dropping, uh, but uh, his name is Ronnie Lott, and he's a, a Hall of Fame uh, uh, defender for the San Francisco 49ers. Ronnie um, and I have talked about how difficult it would be for his sons to play football because of who he is. And can you imagine, you know, Michael Jordan was arguably the greatest basketball player to have lived, and I know there's different opinions that guys on Sports Center and girls will talk about for a long, long time, argue who is better. Uh, but can you imagine a, a greater potential for personal um, kind of uh, damage to self-confidence than stepping out onto a basketball court than being Michael Jordan's son or sons. Now, Jeff and Marcus Jordan are talented, athletic, charismatic players for the University of Central Florida, but the reality is is that they are never going to be able to surpass their father's footsteps. A better, a better idea is to say, what do they want? What do they have in their lives and in their, their genetics and their skill sets and their experience that makes them really tick and that they're better at than, say, 10,000 other people? You know, Michael Jordan was better than you know, 6 billion other people at playing basketball. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the notion that we all have genius and that that means that there are things that we can do, each of us, better than 10,000 other people. Uh, what are those things? You know, this is Albert Einstein as a little boy here on the left side, the taller one of the two, not wearing a skirt. And uh, Einstein said everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Now, Einstein had some skill sets that were off the charts that changed history. Uh, but he also, it was hard for him to learn French if you learn about uh, his background. Um, would you hire Albert Einstein to run your business? Probably not. So the definition of genius and intelligence is different for all of us. And I think it's so, so important as we deal with the next generation and set expectations on the next generation is that the greatest and highest priority that we create is that they find their genius and that they use it as often as they can because that's how they're going to make the world a better place. That's how they're going to improve a family business. That's how they're going to add kind of luster to a badge of family honor, not by trying to force themselves into a role that maybe their father or their mother had that they're just not comfortable with. The, uh, the, the Chinese uh, Taoists have a, a, a saying called Wu Wei, which is the natural way and without, uh, you know, without, without struggle. Um, they also talk in, in the, this kind of philosophy that, uh, you know, it's unproductive to try and force uh, a, a round peg into a square hole or a square hole into a round peg, and that we all have a natural harmony about us that we should we should look to and use. I, I believe that as well. Now we're down to the, the bottom of the, the must-haves to this point about a timeline. Where does it all start? 
It starts with those in control who have legal rights to stay in control until they die if they want to, to say, I'm going to retire from this position, whether that's a position in management, whether that's a position in ownership, or whether it's both, which is my suggestion. Once that retirement date is set, the clock can start ticking and the work can st- the, the mathematics can start of, of kind of backwards integrating a timeline into that date. How much time does it take to integrate a new leader into a position? Well, as you know, consultants have answers for questions like that, and it's usually the same answer, which is it all depends. It all depends on who you are, what the position is, who the next generation is, what the circumstances in, are there health issues, are there service-related issues that are, that are pending. Optimally, you've got five to seven years to do this. Uh, realistically, that usually doesn't happen. But let's, let's say that, that you decide that, it, that if you're 62 years old and you decide that you're going to retire in three years at age 65, well, here we go then. We've got three years to go through three different transition periods. And if you look at the, uh, the text in red here, the first period is one of evaluation, choice, and then what I would call shadowing. So once um, the, the skill sets are identified in the, that are needed and once the next generation uh, leadership pool is determined, um, then the choice is made with outside objective advice. And once that person um, accepts the position and, a, and a, a package of compensation and incentives and roles and responsibilities is clarified, then I would start what's called a shadowing period, where that person follows to as much as he or she can the, the outgoing leader of the business or the, uh, or the board, whatever it might be. And watch, just watch and listen. And then in the second transition period, so this might be a year, to work together as often as possible, maybe even to change statutes and bylaws in decision-making documents that basically say we have to decide together, we have to be unanimous if we're going to make a decision. And then in the third period of transition, that's really the letting go, the ambassador phase, where the, 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 the current generation says it's really happening, I'm really retiring, and I really am letting go. Uh, but I will stay close by. Or if you choose to be a governor, you say, I am not going to stand close by, but there are other people you can talk to to figure out what to do next. I know that's a simplified uh, look, but it's the best I can do at saying, in an ideal situation, there are three transition periods. Uh, your circumstances might be different. They probably are. Um, do the best that you can to create three distinct periods. They don't even have to be equal in time. Uh, but that create the, the kind of softest landing for the next generation of leaders to get in and to not put a jeopardy in any of the relationships with customers or any of the relationships with long-term employees. Because letting go really does mean physically and emotionally. I mean, we have to literally go on to another phase, whatever that might be, and, and making that decision and letting go of, of something that feels so significant and important to us is a hard thing to do. It means breaking patterns, breaking habits, getting outside of comfort zones, and kind of T1 lines of, of behavior, I would call them, that are very, very consistent over time. And finally, honoring the legacy of outgoing leaders. Again, this is a should have, in my opinion. This is something that I feel strongly about. These two guys are leaders of the J.F. Shea Company throughout history, and the Shays are a family that I have worked with, and they have given me specific permission to make that clear and to talk about these wonderful paintings that are in the lobby of their, um, their offices, which are humble offices in Southern California. Now, the Shea family has been involved in building the Golden Gate Bridge, the Hoover Dam, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, the New York Subway System, big, major, life and uh, world-changing structures they've been a part of. So what do you see when you go into their lobby that honors these outgoing legacy, uh, these leaders or their legacies? It's not um, uh, an oil painting in a gray suit and a red tie, which is fine, of course, absolutely fine. But for them, their choice was to, to get these, these men, J.F. Shea and, uh, and, and Edmund Shea, in front of structures that will last hopefully forever, things that are a part of America, that are a part of the world, that changed the world, like the Hoover Dam and the Golden Gate Bridge. 
I think this is so important, next generation. Please listen. Honor the outgoing leaders with something that is authentic to what they're leaving behind and what's important to them. It, you know, these are wonderful, wonderful systems. And uh, authentic honoring of what they're leaving is so important. Um, so in review, ten must-haves, nine must-haves and a should-have, right, we'll call it. So the personal financial plan starts with that and the fair market valuation question of what do we have, what do I need, what do I want in order to feel comfortable. Um, what is my vision of my legacy? How do I want to be remembered when I'm no longer here? What do I want my grandchildren to think of when they think of me? Um, what kind of a retirement style am I willing to communicate to my world and influence that I'm going to follow? If I'm going to be a monarch, let's let everybody know right now. If I'm going to be uh, an ambassador, let's talk about it right now and set some expectations. And what are the assets we're dealing with? What's the contingency planning in, case, in a worst-case scenario in case the bus uh, happens to, uh, to end my day? Objective outside advice, you know, the outside advisors, um, people who have been in your industry who have solved problems that you're trying to solve are the best ones to bring on to your board. And you know what? By and large, they're pretty happy to do it. They're happy. They're in a, a, a point in their careers where they will give back and give back freely. What do the next generation need to do well? Who are the potential leaders? Uh, what's the timeline for evaluation, choice, integration, and letting go? And then how do we, in an authentic way, honor the outgoing leaders? Now, here's an assignment for you. You've got a piece of paper and a pencil somewhere close by. Grab it now and write down the next specific thing that you're going to do that's going to move you closer to having a fabulous succession plan. What is it? Is it a conversation that you're going to have with someone who is significant? And is it potentially a, a tough, tough conversation that you're going to have? Because let's, let's be honest. Succession planning happens after tough discussions happen. Okay? It's not easy to think about these things. It's not easy to make judgments on people's um, business performance or uh, on their credibility. It's not easy to let go of something that means uh, a lot and that you've nurtured and taken good care of. But if the family business system that you've created or have been a part of is going to last beyond your life, these conversations and these steps have to take place. Uh, with that, I'll give you my contact information and that of Otis, uh, my, my, uh, my partner who works with uh, our banking relationships here, and tell you I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Send me an email. Uh, it might not get responded to within an hour, but it will be responded to as promptly as possible. I hope you've enjoyed and learned from this um, webinar. and. Uh, and best of luck to you in taking your family business systems into a, a, a new world and a new generation of family harmony and business success and lots and lots and lots of golden eggs. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dana. We have time, I think, for one or two quick questions. You had talked about um, the John Davis study with the difference in perceptions between how how younger generations feel that they're communicating in the business and how parents feel that they're communicating. Yes. What do you see as some tools families can use to get on the same page and improve that from both directions? Well, I, th I think the most, you know, like in the, the story about Tom um, and Stu Leonard, there is, there is an assumption, I think, uh, in the next generation, the younger generation, that they really do have to kind of toe the line and show respect. I mean, these are these are values uh, and principles in in most Western well in most societies around the world that you know we are respectful to our parent. If we're respectful to a parent, we're not going to say, "Look, I don't like working with you. I don't want to do what you want me to do." It's not easy to do that. And so, just creating space, and it really needs to come from the senior generation, creating a time and a place where you know parents and children sit down, and parents say very specifically. Let's talk as business people, okay? You tell me what I need to do better towards succession planning. You tell me your professional 
skill sets and goals. And then to say after a conversation like that, now let's talk as parents and children. What is it that's going to make you happy in your life? What, what's going to get you out of bed every morning and make you feel charged up about the world that we live in? Uh, because, you know, if, if a younger next generation person brings it up, it's too easy for them to be labeled as, you know, impatient or greedy or both. And that's not fair because it, it's a legitimate question, uh, which is, you know, what are we doing here? And, and am I doing this because I'm your son or daughter or because I'm good at it or because I want to or some combination of, of those three? Any, if you have a parent that's more reticent about starting that conversation and you don't want to be labeled as the, the greedy, pushing the parent out the door, younger generation, what's a, what are some tactful ways to start that conversation? Yeah, the, you know, one of the things, um, your organization is providing a lot of written materials that, that we're, you know, partnering with you, Jennifer, to, cre you know, we're creating articles, we've written books that are about these difficult subjects. And, and you know, one idea, if, if mom or dad is just not ready to engage in that kind of a conversation, you know, even dropping an article on, on mom or dad's desk uh, or the kitchen table uh, with a little note on it that says, hey, I, you know, I read this, I thought it was really interesting. Does it apply to us with a question mark? Or how does it apply to us might be the icebreaker that you need. Others would say, you know, the timing of that conversation is crucial. You know, some would say it, that conversation can only happen on, you know, I'm thinking of a family in Minneapolis, on horseback with dad. Others would say on a golf course, on a boat, on Sunday afternoon after um, you know that we've had dinner together and the and the you know the the table is cleaned up. Others would say oh, you know it's over a glass of wine, uh, whatever it might be. It, it, it's one of it's an art really. There's no science to it, Jennifer. You know it's it's we got to know who we're dealing with and we and it means we got to take a risk at some point and and kind of take that, that deep breath and that gulp and say, hey, something that's hard for me to bring up, but let's have this discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time today, and we look forward to joining you for our next webcast. Thanks to all our participants for joining us today. We hope you found this webcast presentation informative. This concludes the webcast. You may now disconnect.